In today's video, we will be looking at Gneisenau, the second of the Scharnhorst class battleships. She of the regularly mispronounced name. Is it Gneisenau? Is it Neisenau? Or is it Neisenau? It really depends on which German you're asking, and that's before you get into regional dialects and accents. That aside, this is also the less famous of the two ships. Unless you watch World of Warships videos, in which case you probably know her best, as Jingle's favorite punchline. While admittedly amusing, it is a shame because this ship did see action of her own. Until, of course, the British had something to say about that. Let's look at her story in this video, from launch to dry dock to block ship. That story began on May 6th, 1935. Gneisenau was laid down in Kiel on that day, where work would progress at a fairly fast rate. The battleship would, in fact, be launched around a year and a half later, on December 8th, 1936. For any battleship, that was a decent enough speed. For Germany, who hadn't built a battleship since the Bayerns, it is impressive. That speed of construction was maintained into the fitting out stage, which saw the ship commission on May 21st, 1938. A little over three years after she was laid down, the battleship entered into service. But what did the Germans actually get for all that work? Well, the Scharnhorst twins are sometimes called battle cruisers, even though the Navy that built them never did. In fact, the only ships the Germans called battle cruisers in this period were the O class. Fast, heavily armed, but lightly armored. Very typically British. The Scharnhorst, meanwhile, do admittedly match up with Imperial German design doctrine. Fast, heavily armored, but with relatively small caliber guns. Classic Grossekreuzer. However, the Germans called them Schlagschiff, or Battleship. And as I make a point of referring to ships by what their navy called them, I will continue to refer to these ships as Battleships from here on out. Right, with that out of the way, let's look at the design details real quick. As built, Gneisenau displaced around 32,600 tons at her standard loading. This rose as high as 39,000 tons at full load, and likely a fair bit more as wartime modifications were made. On that displacement, the ship carried three triple turrets, two super firing on the bow and one on the stern. This is where the confusion on battleship or battle cruiser typically comes from, because those turrets were equipped with three 28 centimeter or 11 inch guns each for a total of nine such weapons. 11 inch guns were, of course, not remotely typical for battleships by this point. Nonetheless, the Germans chose the 11 inch gun. To support the main battery, these ships also carried 12 15 centimeter. 5.9 inch secondary guns, 8 in twin mounts, and 4 in single mounts clustered around the superstructure. These were, in turn, supported by 14 10.5 centimeter anti aircraft guns, alongside a further 16 3.7 centimeter anti aircraft guns. The light anti aircraft battery also included a smattering of 20 millimeter guns that was steadily increased in number as the ship's career progressed. Wrapping up the weaponry were six 21-inch torpedo tubes with one triple mount on either side of the ship. These were added in a later refit. The ship also carried three float planes. Armor protection, for its part, consisted of a 350mm, 13.8-inch main belt, and a deck that ranged from 50 to 105 millimeters, or 2 to 4 inches, in thickness. All of this was pushed through the water at around 31 knots, by 164,000 shaft horsepower through three shafts. And, with the design out of the way, we can now return to service history. This started out rather rough, as the ship underwent her sea trials. Gneisenau would suffer a common problem with large German warships of the time. Her straight stem bow, and being a bit front-heavy, made the battleship very wet, as in... Are we sure this isn't a U-boat, water is up to the bridge, levels of wet? With this in mind, the ship was put in for a refit. Exactly when the refit began varies between sources. Some say October of 1938, others will say January of 1939. This refit would see the bow completely rebuilt 
and replaced with an Atlantic bow. This was higher up and far more flared. It helped, but the ships remained notoriously poor sea boats for their entire career. Regardless of when the refit actually began, the battleship rejoined the fleet properly in mid-1939. Specifically, in June of that year, the ship went through a second set of sea trials. This lasted from June through July of 1939, mostly on target practice and other such things. During this, it was discovered that a turret, the Balmos one, remained a problem in heavy seas, and no amount of refit would change that. Issues with that turret aside, this second round of sea trials went well enough. Gneisenau would return to Germany and remain there when September rolled around. And if you know your history, you know that the Second World War began in September of 1939. Unsurprisingly, the British were quick to begin their tradition of bombing German battleships. Gneisenau was bombed on September 4th, the day after the British declared war. None of them hit their mark, as Gneisenau's luck held out for the moment. Gneisenau would remain in Germany through to late November after this, with the exception of a short sortie on October 7th that didn't amount to much. The first proper combat action came on November 21st when she joined Scharnhorst on another sortie. The twins set out into the North Atlantic to patrol between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. This was a mission with multiple objectives. On the one hand, it was to intercept enemy shipping if they could find any. On the other, it was to draw out British warships to distract from the hunt for Groff's Bay. In both regards, it mostly failed. Except for one particularly famous action. That being the sinking of the auxiliary cruiser Royal Pendy on November 23, 1939. Worthy of a video all its own, this action saw the old converted liner square up against the new battleships. The result was expected, as Roald Pendy was sent to the bottom. As for drawing out the Royal Navy, well, this technically worked. If by technically, you mean drawing out a group featuring Hood, Nelson, Rodney, and Dunkirk to chase them. The Germans promptly did the runaway meme, because that was a task group no one wanted to fight. But it still didn't succeed in the stated goal of drawing heat off Spey. She would be chased to Montevideo and ultimately scuttled soon after this. In any case, the battleships returned home by November 27th and promptly went in for repair work. Storm damage had been severe enough to require dry dock time, during which Gneisenau was modified once more. The bow was flared out even more to try and improve her sea keeping. Again, this helped, but the issue never entirely went away. A third set of sea trials followed on January 15th, of 1940. This went well enough, but ice blocked the Kiel Canal when she returned to port. This locked the ship in the Baltic until that thawed on February 4, 1940. Soon after that, the Scharnhorst, joined by Admiral Hipper, set out into the North Sea once more. This was on February 18th, and the patrol lasted two days. Things would be quiet following this until April. The twins were assigned to the invasion of Norway, departing Germany on April 7th, once more joined by Hipper and 14 assorted destroyers. Of those ships, only the Scharnhorst were intended for direct combat. Hipper and the destroyers were doing double duty as troop ships while the battleships escorted them. During this, Hipper would have her famous duel with HMS Glowworm on April 8th, 1940. The Scharnhorst sisters, for their part, would have a less famous battle with HMS Renown the following day. Early in the morning on April 9th, Gneisenau's radar spotted Renown. While the Germans prepared for battle, the British opened fire first. Over the course of this action, Gneisenau hit Renown twice. One shell was a dud, and the other damaged the bow cruiser's radio. This is confirmed by several sources. On the other side of things, it's a bit more foggy. The most commonly accepted result that I've seen is Renown hitting Gneisenau with three shells. One from her 15-inch guns that passed clean through the director tower, disabling the main director and killing five men, along with two hits from the secondary battery that did minor damage. With that done, the twins broke off and escaped from the battle, although in their mad dash, they suffered severe forward flooding that messed with the bow turrets. By April 12th, Gneisenau was back in Germany. 
She would remain there for routine overhauls until the end of April. She was going to return to service at that point, but on May 5th, the first bit of bad luck arrived, because Gneisenau hit a mine. It buckled the hull and flooded the stern. The force of the blast also disabled the starboard turbine and the aft rangefinders. While at no real risk of sinking, the battleship still required further repair work. This lasted until the end of May, at the conclusion of which she returned to service, and was promptly sent back to Norwegian waters on June 4th, once more rejoining Admiral Hipper. This would see a couple British ships sunk, but the really notable thing came on June 8th, 1940, that being the sinking of HMS Glorious, a black mark on the Royal Navy, if there ever was one. The German battleships managed the incredibly rare feat of sinking an aircraft carrier in a gunfight. And not an escort carrier, but a full-on fleet carrier. If an admittedly old one. The escorting destroyers, Arden and Acosta, were also sunk. But not before they managed a torpedo hit on Scharnhorst, forcing the Germans to pull back after they finished the British off. Gneisenau would suffer similar damage soon after, on June 20th. The ship was sent out to distract the British, while Scharnhorst returned home. However, during this process, the submarine HMS Clyde landed a hit on the battleship's bow. The damage required Gneisenau to return home as well. Repairs for this would take five months in total, with the ship rejoining the fleet in December of 1940. Unfortunately for the Germans, Gneisenau would soon be back in for more repairs after that. At the end of December and into early January, the Scharnhorst sisters attempted to break into the Atlantic. However, severe storms kicked up, once more causing damage to Gneisenau. This time, at least, the repair work was quick. By January 22, 1941, the ships were ready to set sail. This was Operation Berlin, and would see the ships raiding the Atlantic. While spotted by the British early on, the Germans evaded all attempts to catch them. By February 3rd, they were in the Atlantic. This was destined to be the most successful sortie by German battleships, for the most part. There were two run-ins with British battleships that did cause issues. First, a convoy escorted by HMS Ramillies. While the twins were probably a good match for Ramillies, the Germans were under strict orders to avoid capital ships. So they broke off and went hunting for easier targets. They would, later on, run into another convoy escorted by HMS Malaya, and they left this one alone, too. Nonetheless, this was a successful raid. The Germans sank about 108,000 tons of shipping between the sisters. However, a survivor of the last group managed to radio for help on March 16th. HMS Rodney and King George V arrived in the area as a result. There's a story that Gneisenau was spotted by Rodney, and slipped away by identifying herself as the much smaller HMS Emerald. I'm not entirely sure how true that is, but it makes for a fun story. Certainly, she had a hair-raising escape as Rodney loomed out of the darkness and almost caught up. Either way, the Germans chose to end the raiding at this point, sailing for Brest. They arrived on March 22nd and went in for routine maintenance, where they would be constantly bombed by the British. These didn't do damage initially, although a raid on April 5th did come close. This prompted Gneisenau to be taken out of dry dock and into the harbor, where British torpedo bombers attacked on April 6th. A Beaufort landed a single torpedo to the ship's stern. This hit disabled much of her propulsion, forcing Gneisenau back in dry dock, where she was hit again on the night of April 9th. Four bombs hit Gneisenau, with two detonating. The repairs, and modifications made during that, kept the battleship in dock. With Brest too hot and a decision to focus on the Arctic convoys, the Scharnhorse and Prince Eugen were pulled back home. This resulted in the Channel Dash on February 11, 1942. This would be a triumph for the Germans and another embarrassment to the British. After all, the most damage done to the Germans was Gneisenau striking a mine on the way home and then striking a submerged wreck in harbor, doing more underwater damage. This seems like bad luck. However, the real bad luck was soon to come. The repair work for the channel dash damage concluded on February 26, 1942, 
and as she was scheduled to move to Norway in early March, the ship was loaded up for action, including stocking the magazines. On the night of February 26th, the British once more sent bombers after Gneisenau. This time, the result was catastrophic. A bomb hit her bow, penetrating the armor and exploding. This set off a massive explosion, throwing the number one turret off its mount and wrecking the bow. Had the crew not partially flooded the magazine, it might have been even worse. With the bow basically ruined, the Germans decided the effort to repair the ship wasn't worth it, especially with the number one turret wrecked. Instead, modifications began to exchange the main battery out, swapping to twin 38cm, 15-inch turrets for a total of six guns. This necessitated even more modifications to the bow, among other things. It was not a simple process, being even more complex than the similar work done on Mogami in Japan. Because of this, while the ship was repaired enough to begin the process in early 1943, well, things didn't turn out that way. With the general drawdown of the German surface fleet, Gneisenau was left in place. Her weaponry was stripped and used as shore batteries, with the stern turret ending up in Norway, where it remains to this day. The stripped Hulk, meanwhile, remained in Gotenhaven. She would be there for the rest of the war, even as the Red Army advanced in 1945. What remained of her skeleton crew took the ship out into the harbor and sank her as a block ship, as a final act of defiance. That was on March 27, 1945. In 1947, the Poles, now in control of the area, ordered the battleship scrapped. This process would see the ship refloated in 1951, and scrapped from that point onwards. This is where Gneisenau's story comes to an end. She had a relatively short active career, but it was an eventful one. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.